Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the Kinder Institute Forum. Uh, I'm Bill Fulton, the director of the Kinder Institute for Urban Research here at Rice. Um, and welcome to the KI Forum with uh, our esteemed speaker, Henry Cisneros. We're really thrilled to have Henry here tonight. Um, uh, the KI Forum is our premier lecture series bringing urban thought leaders to Houston. Um, please live tweet tonight at hashtag KI Forum. Heather, where are you? Our, our live tweeter, Heather Layton, is with us. Um, and uh, uh, the KI Forum is made possible thanks to our friends at Centerpoint Energy, the lead sponsor of the lecture series. And I'm going to ask Tracy Yonda to come up and say a few words from Centerpoint. Thank you very much, Tracy, for all of Centerpoint's support. Thank you so much. Thank you. So good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to make a few um, welcoming remarks and to express appreciation for you. Um, for you being here. So on behalf of Centerpoint Energy and our approximately 14,000 employees nationwide, we're pleased to once again sponsor the Kinder Institute Speaker Series. Our company takes tremendous pride in the relationships and partnerships that we have in the communities where we live and work. And in addition to our commitment to deliver safe and reliable electricity and natural gas, we actively engage in addressing the needs of our communities uh, through donation of both financial and human resources. So many of you know our company as it operates here in Houston. We're the folks that keep the lights on and uh, also make sure that that um, natural gas uh, blue flame is working on your gas stove. Um, you might have also heard that yesterday our uh, folks, um, 70 of our Centerpoint linemen and support personnel and their equipment left yesterday morning to travel to Dallas. We have mutual assistance agreements with um, our utility partners, and those folks are in Dallas as we speak, restoring power to the areas that were impacted by the tornado on Sunday. Um, but you might not know that our natural gas operations extend outside the Houston area to certain Texas regions and seven other states, and so our uh, assets are, are primarily up and down the midsection of the country. So I think it's safe to say that our company is critical to the infrastructure of our communities and um, that's why this partnership with the Kinder Institute and experts like the Honorable Henry Cisneros uh, aligns so well with our corporate vision. So to have surviving and thriving communities, you need the infrastructure of utilities like Centerpoint Energy, you need the expertise of our speaker, and you need the research and data for informed decision making, which is the trademark of Kinder Institute's organization. So we're very excited to be partners in this work. We hope you enjoy tonight's presentation as well as uh, the rest of the presentations that will be happening during this year's series. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I want to say as well, uh, generous support also comes through multi-year grant from our partners at Houston Endowment, and the Institute itself relies on philanthropic investments from many contributors, including Nancy and Rich Kinder and the Kinder Foundation, Laura and Tom Bacon, Tom Bacon's right there, uh, Chevron, Wells Fargo, Raynette and Stan Merrick, BP America, HEB, Catherine and Hank Coleman, Sarah and Doug Fauché, Sis and Hasty Johnson, Francie Neely, uh, Becky and Ralph O'Connor, Bank of America, Bracewell, uh, I'm sorry, those are two different firms, Bank of America and Bracewell, uh, PNC, Bank, Heinz, Silver Eagle Distributors, and United Way of Greater Houston. I have a whole long introduction, uh, written introduction for Henry, but I think I'm going to instead say it's a thrill to have Henry here tonight, Henry Cisneros, and I'm proud to say Henry has been my friend for 35 years. Uh, since he was the mayor of San Antonio and I was a young journalist wanting to write about urban issues and we met in San Antonio. And one of the remarkable things about Henry is that wherever I have gone in my journey as an urbanist in this country for the last 35 years, somehow or other Henry has been there. Um, he was the mayor of San Antonio in the 1980s, he was the HUD secretary in the 1990s. Um, when I started to work with other urban planners in Los Angeles after the 1992 Los Angeles riots, I went to a meeting and all of a sudden Henry was there. When I, was the, when I wound up as the planning director of San Diego in 2013, I got a phone call from Henry saying, well, you know we're building middle-income housing in San Diego. <laughs> 
So, I, and I can say from 35 years of experience that there is no more inspirational person in the field of urban planning and in the field of urbanism in this country than Henry Cisneros. And when Henry and I first started talking about this lecture, and we talked about this topic of building equitable cities, one of the things uh, that he wanted to say was, you know, cities are remarkable human creations. They perform incredible functions for people. And one of the most remarkable things they can do is provide for upward mobility for people. And I think that, and I think that's a, as we transition in Houston to be a more urban place, this is a tremendously important lesson and a tremendously important set of things that we must undertake and think about. And I can think of no one better to inspire us and, and guide us on this way than Henry Cisneros. So Henry, come on up. Bill, thank you very much. Thank you for your kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Thank you for your friendship over the years, and thank you for the good work you've done in this field. Um, one of the uh, ground rules for this evening is that we hope to have you home by the sixth inning. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to uh, go right into my remarks, and, uh, but I look forward to your questions. So after, at that point, you're in charge as to whether you get home by the sixth inning. I would say the only interruption that I will uh, entertain in the course of my remarks, if I see a hand, it's because you have a score to announce to the entire group. <laughs> Tracy and uh, Centerpoint, thank you very much to all of the support system for the Kinder Institute for Urban Research. Uh, I, I want to say a special word of thanks to Bill, who uh, I have known in his capacities as an author, as a mayor, as an urban planner, and now in an academic setting. Uh, he's the only person that I know in America who used to write for all of the major planning magazines and, and, and books. Then he became the mayor of Ventura, California. Then he became the city planning director for the city of Los Angeles. And now he's sharing all of that experience with Houston and the world through the Kinder Institute. So uh, you're fortunate to have that kind of urban talent here. Um, it's also a special treat to recognize the founding director of the Kinder Institute, the first person assigned to that role, uh, Dr. Steve Kleinberg, who of course is very famous in Houston. There's hardly an article published on anything related to urban that Steve Kleinberg is not quoted or referenced in some form. Uh, but it's also true across the country. And it's just an indication of the national significance, global significance of rice and the research that's there. Uh, also seated in the audience this evening is a colleague, uh, Bill and uh, Colin Clark and I are working on a, a book together on the Texas Triangle cities. Colin is at the uh, Bush Institute in Dallas and SMU, and he is with us this evening, so I'm glad, Cullen, that you made the trip and we had a chance to visit this afternoon. And then I'd like to take one point of personal privilege and introduce members of my family. My uh, sister-in-law, of whom our entire family is very proud, Carla Cisneros, is in the audience this evening. She is council person from District H here in Houston, the Heights and the navigation area and a district that sprawls all over north and uh, north, uh, the western, uh, rather the eastern part of, of Houston. Uh, she and my brother, Tim, who is here, met as graduate students at Rice, at the uh, School of Architecture at Rice. Uh, so uh, that was a very productive educational experience for them <laughs> that had lifetime implications. <laughs> and I've always found over the years that it's very important to have uh, someone uh, on the city council who has a design, architecture, planning background, and Houston at this time has Carla Cisneros. So I want to just recognize them and the family that's here, Carla and Tim. And my nephew, their son David, who is here with his new wife, Hira, 
And uh, David just finished in the MBA program at Rice. Rice is all over this tonight. <laughs> and took a job with uh, Trammell Crow, where he'll be working in commercial real estate in Houston. Um, so I want to talk to you tonight about three things. And I'm going to work through them in a, in a kind of a, a organized way. The first is to tell you something about this being a global era for urban opportunity. All over the world, uh, national economies, the global economy are driven by what has happened in the great metros of the world. Houston is one of those. Secondly, that this creates a unique moment for cities to step in and become platforms for urban equity, for dealing with the issues of urban inequality, which are or rather of, of, of uh, income inequality, which are affecting the world and which national and state governments seem to have lost interest, but which are focused in our cities. Therefore, we have to be attentive at the city level. And thirdly, I want to talk a little bit about what that means for Houston. So you'll permit me as I go through these three points in that, in that fashion. For the first time in the history of mankind, more people now live in the world's urban areas than in rural areas. Uh, in the United States, we've known we were an urban nation for some time, but Asia and Africa and Latin America were not. They now are. Africa is the last of the continents to officially become an urban continent. Uh, but it, it is a major uh, milestone for mankind. We've seen that playing out in places like China, where the growth of China over the last uh, decades has been driven by the transformation of the country itself, not just economy, but the country itself into an urban setting. Uh, China today has about 100 cities over a million population. It's estimated that by 2040 it will have 200 cities over a million population. San Antonio was looking for a sister city in China a few years ago, and they, and they referred us to two possible candidates, Wuxi and, um, I forget the name of the other city, I, uh, Wuxi and oh, Suzhou. Wuxi and Suzhou, I had never heard of either one. They told us that those were appropriate for us because they were secondary cities. They were six million and eight million population. <laughs> Uh, but it is a, an unbelievable process that's happening around the world. And we know, some economists have said, the trading relationships between nations are really kind of a, a, a fabrication. They're, 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 they're a framework. The real trading relationships are between Los Angeles and Singapore or Tokyo. Uh, the trading relationships are between New York and Frankfurt and London. Um, so, uh, and, and Houston, of course, with, the, sh with the, the ship channel, trades with all of those major centers. So uh, it is an, an, a, a fascinating era globally, but clearly true in the United States. My uh, chief of staff, when I was HUD secretary, is a man named Bruce Katz. He created the uh, uh, urban center at the Brookings Institution and ended, ending up writing a book entitled Metropolitan Nation, in which he made the case that America is clearly a metropolitan economy in which uh, about 65% of the national population lives in just the 100 largest metropolitan areas. We have thousands of metros in the United States, but just in the largest 100, 65% of the population lives. They, however, produce 75% of the national GDP in those 100 places. And they, in turn, have 78% of the research, patents, and creative work in the national economy. So it's clear that our cities play a critical role, and Bruce's subsequent book is called The New Localism, which describes how much is happening at the local level that's important to the country. Just some evidence of what is happening. New York City, which is had a population of 8 million people for the last number of decades, is now pointing to 9 million people. Boston has nine mega projects right underway at, th at, at this time. 
that include corporate headquarters and major re research commitments. When President Obama greeted the G20 some years ago and he wanted to show them the essence of change and progress in America, he took them to Pittsburgh because of the transformation of Steel City into the technology, medical, and, and, and academic center that it is. Atlanta's downtown is growing for the first time in 50 years. Miami has become the economic capital of Latin America. Every national origin in Latin America has banking relationships and trade relationships in Miami. Nashville is the third fastest growing city in the country after Austin, which has been the first fastest growing city in America a good part of the last decade. Denver inner city neighborhoods are growing and gentrifying and changing and, and, and uh, adding very attractive settings. Seattle is the headquarters to company like Amazon, which is not an unmixed blessing. Uh, Seattle is confronting a major homeless problem, but it's a result of the growth of jobs in the tune of 50,000 people in these major corporations. Similarly, San Francisco. Los Angeles is for the first time creating a viable downtown. Uh, the city, in, which has been uh, described as having no there there, suddenly has a there in places like Live Nation and Staples Center, an arts district uh, transforming Los Angeles. And then there are the cities of the Texas Triangle, Dallas-Fort Worth in the north, San Antonio and Austin in the southeast, and Houston, our largest Texas city, our most powerful Texas city in the southeast quadrant of the Texas Triangle. Uh, all of them growing dramatically. Uh, Texas today has three cities, Houston, San Antonio, and Dallas in that order, in the top 10 most populous in the country. That has happened only once before in American history when Brooklyn, uh, Buffalo and New York City were in the top 10 most populous. That tells you how long ago that was. It was the 1860s that one state had three cities. Austin sits at number 11. And it's expected in the next census, Austin will pass number 10, which is San Jose, and Texas will have four out of the 10 most populous cities in America. It's never happened before in American history. Oh, and by the way, Fort Worth sits at number 13. So uh, it's an amazing dynamic of urban renaissance, if you will, occurring across the country. There's some reasons why this is happening. The, most, the, the, the best that I can describe to you is that the American economy has changed in a way that is very urban friendly. A country that was once manufacturing based uh, in the 1930s through the 1950s has seen the manufacturing jobs either go offshore or to rural areas, suburban areas, places in the south. And the cities were left with the residue of empty plants and sites, uh, which spawned the conversation about the urban crisis that dominated our thinking about cities in the 1960s and 70s. But today, the American economy is very different. It's no longer manufacturing based. It's professional services. It's new media, it's international trade, it's hospitality, it's medical centers, it's great universities. All of those are more city-friendly bases creating what they call anchor institutions that create jobs and contracts. Houston is a perfect example of a city riding the crest of that new economy. And it, 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 it is, it's creating great prosperity in ma many of our major metropolitan areas. There are other reasons why this is happening. City governments that once were sort of providers of just basic services, today are uh, masters of their own destinies in terms of uh, par public-private partnerships and uh, all kinds of uh, entrepreneurial activity on the part of city governments. Uh, demographics of the cities has changed. Today, people are coming into the cities. The creative class of young millennials Immigrants for whom cities have been traditional staging areas, but coming in larger numbers, as Dr. Kleinberg's work describes Houston. Uh, the baby boomer population, as people retire and they want to move in from the McMansion and the suburbs to a place of kind of intense, stimulating urban life, they come into the cities. 
uh, and uh, groups like middle class uh, minorities. As, as minority populations move into the middle class and live in the cities, those neighborhoods come back as well. So all across the spectrum, we're seeing the population dynamics work in favor of cities. There are a couple of other things I would mention. Uh, one of them is as the technology economy has changed and grown and become more a part of the city, uh, it attracts people who want local amenities. Uh, a few, a couple of decades ago, John Nesbitt wrote a book called Megatrends in which he described a phenomenon he called high tech and high touch. That the more technology dominates people's work life, the more they want in their personal lives a sense of high touch with places to eat and relax and enjoy and recreate and so forth. So the cities are the places where that can occur. And so big companies employing tens of thousands of people like Salesforce in San Francisco or Amazon in Seattle are finding the cities as the place where they can create those environments. Public-private partnerships are the order of the day. We have a more hybrid economy where public investment fits in with, private investment fits in with public investment. And then there is a generation of community-based advocates of of uh, nonprofit entrepreneurs working to do everything from creating housing to focusing on neighborhood uh, strip centers uh, to creating employment uh, training programs. So that all of that mix, all of those things come together and create this era. So the second point I said I wanted to make is how cities are emerging or are, are transitioning from their traditional functions to what I want to call platforms for equity. Let me kind of describe that process. Cities have traditionally been the places where basic functions occur, the following basic functions. Places where we work, places where we live, places where we learn, places where we gather for recreation, and places where we govern ourselves. You recognize all of those traditional functions of our metropolitan areas and cities. But the new dynamics of how our cities are composed create an opportunity to integrate economically, to create centers of upward mobility, to focus on economic advancement, platforms for personal achievement, and indeed for social justice and economic equity. The questions are, can cities use this point of inflection in terms of the, the, the juice, the economic momentum behind cities to, on the cusp of new opportunities to harness these powerful dynamics and make them work for people who are at the margins of the society? Can city governments and city leaders design intentional strategies to do this? We've known for a long time that cities have been platforms for advancement in American society. That's why immigrants have succeeded in cities for the last hundred years, because the opportunities exist there to start a small business. The next generation does better. But, but more and more cities are thinking intentionally about how to advance that process, how to accelerate that process. And that's the, 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 the thing that I want to focus on this evening. Uh, we have important shared equity objectives in our society. Advancing civil rights, sustaining a safety net of economic security, leveling the playing field of access for opportunity. Those are the ideals, if you will, that deal with equity that we share. And our governments have played a role. Since the Depression, when we created Social Security and opened public accommodations and later in the, in the uh, Great Society years, expanded voting rights and fair housing, health care reform, labor protections, education strategies like Head Start and affordable housing, the federal government has played a role in pushing forward American equity, in closing the distribution of income, the gaps in the distribution of income. But unfortunately, the federal government today is gridlocked in many ways. Uh, in part by budget realities uh, and deficits, 
and in part by basic disagreement on what is the function of government and what role should the federal government play. So I would argue we're seeing less of a proactive role on the part of the federal government to deal with the kinds of equity questions I just defined. The states have responsibilities in this arena. The states, if they wanted to, could play a role because they fund public education, because they're responsible for higher education, because they have important responsibilities in the health arena, but there are very few states in America that you could say they are advocates for social equity. That's not the prism through which they view their responsibilities. So we're entering an era where if America is going to deal with its income inequality and equity questions, it's going to have to be at the local level of government. It's not the ideal place to do this because it ends up being spotty and, and, and different across the country, but it is the, it is the right place when you consider where are the people who need the help the most. And if indeed cities are thriving and growing and prospering in the way we suggest, there are instruments, there are tools, there are resources which can be brought to bear to create a more equitable society. The elements of this strategy must be, are, are, are embedded in the very purpose of a city to bring people together to create a better life. I saw a quotation the other day on a poster, and I spoke at a, actually it was an architectural firm, and the poster said, if happiness is an inalienable right, and Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence with that idea, if happiness is an inalienable right, then that must be the purpose, one of the, one of the purposes of our cities. And there's people around the world who think in this way about the role of cities. The former mayor of Bogota, Colombia, Enrique Peñalosa, uh, really redefined his purpose as mayor of Bogota to create a more just city, a place where people can pursue personal happiness. Uh, profound idea. Uh, it must be evident in the inclusiveness of governance in our cities, that is to say voice, representation, and it must be intentional strategy of progressive city leaders. Again, the notion of intentionality. Let me digress for just a moment and try to describe what I mean by the subject of equity. These are my own thoughts, but I've put down five areas where we can measure how equitable or inequitable a city is. One of them is economic metrics like the percentage of poverty or differences in employment, neighborhood, uh, employment levels across populations, income inequality, what's called the Gini concentration ratio that defines the deciles, if you will, of inequality in a city. So one measure is economic inequality. Another measure would be spatial and geographic inequality, the concentration of poverty, the intensity of segregation, the inequity in public investments. Some neighborhoods get invested in, others do not with public or private resources. So spatial, geographic inequalities. We know that those exist. One looks at the different wards of Houston and you can quickly see which, which have uh, received resources over the years or not. Another form of inequality is the openness of opportunity. That is to say, how segmented and rigid is the labor market? Is it possible for people to start in a business at a lower place in the economic rung and climb? Or are business created in such a way that never the twain shall meet? There's a lot of writing on the subject of segmented labor markets that make, makes clear that many of our, our economic functions today do not have the ability to provide that kind of upward flow. If you get into the wrong segment, if you start at the bottom segment of that company, you can rise to a level but never beyond that. Uh, and, and people start into the hierarchy of leadership at a, at a much different place in the company. Our, our, our economy has changed in that way. Access to capital is another manifestation of openness of opportunity and educational options, the, the quality and access to education. Uh, an, another measure of, of equity would be 
what is the nature of inclusiveness in the city? Is there a sense in the governance, in the systems of government, in the cultural setting of the city that makes it feel like an inclusive place, that people are welcomed across ethnic groups, across income groups. That's another measure of equity. And finally, I would say there is equity across generations. Uh, are, for example, people who uh, have become older and are frail and have no resources, do they have a place in the society? We're finding um, huge numbers of people who say they, they, they don't have enough money to retire on. They're, they're, they're really at the mercy of the society in terms of where they're going to live. So one day I was thinking, how do we begin to kind of make practical and, and, and descriptive what would an equitable city look like? What would it be? So I wrote my thoughts, and let me just share with you briefly what I think an, equity, an equitable city would mean. It would be a community characterized by social and economic equity that would have open pathways to opportunity no matter a person's origins. Residents could reasonably hope to rise from the most poverty-stricken neighborhoods or from the penniless frust frustration of the immigrant to a quality education and to the economic and reputational rewards of hard work. People could strive and sacrifice in the knowledge that rewards are fairly allocated for work, if not in the immediate generation, then for children and loved ones in the subsequent generation. In an equitable city, those rewards would be apportioned not by inheritance or elitism, not through legacies of segregation or favoritism or unfair advantage. Cities can be the building blocks of the society that Dr. King prayed for when he dreamed that people would be judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. It would be an urban society in which higher education was accessible. Jobs were expanding and were characterized by career tracks to advancement. Access to decent housing was fair and non-discriminatory. Capital was accessible for striving entrepreneurs in disinvested neighborhoods. And public decision-making was inclusive, open, and intentionally equity-driven. Such a city would reap the benefits of its quest for equity. It would reap the benefits in productivity, in ambitions unleashed, in talents fulfilled, in creativity, in investment uh, allocated. Uh, that, that's my sense of what we should be striving for and what we want to create in a great American city. Now, I don't know of a city in America where all of the pieces of what it takes to build equity are happening, but I know a lot of them that are working on the various pieces. Let me give you a sense. Equity in the workplace. Boston has something they call the backstreet strategy, which focuses on the unglamorous businesses that are not the fashion of the day, but deserve support and investment. Cleveland is refocusing its economy on medical devices companies around the Cleveland Clinic, which is one of their great assets, uh, like the medical center is here, not on the same scale as the Houston Medical Center, but important. San Francisco city government has created something called Bank on San Francisco. And it's a whole series of economic things like earned income tax credit and other things that citizens can avail themselves up of in order to create economic equity. Philadelphia is harnessing anchor institutions. I mentioned earlier the, those, those big employing and contracting centers. In the Philadelphia case, it's the University of Pennsylvania. And West Philadelphia has altered itself based on the University of Pennsylvania, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and other major medical institutions in West Philly. And of course, Houston is, it has efforts underway. I'm very impressed with a lot of the nonprofits here focusing on the reality of the immigrant potential in Houston, working at the neighborhood level with immigrants. So equity in the kind of work environment, that track of economic equity. There's equity in how we live. Austin, I mean, Atlanta, Atlanta has now 
eliminated all of its traditional public housing and rebuilt it all, the first city in America to have no longer have any 1930s, 1940s, 50s vintage public housing. It's all remade in modern, less dense, safer, uh, various kinds of hybrid approaches to ownership, et cetera. One of the most beautiful is one of the first public housing developments in the South. President Roosevelt uh, inaugurated it. I've been there many times, adjacent to Georgia Tech. And, and, and it, it, it's created a charter school for little children, scholarship relationships to the university. It's an amazing thing, almost like campus housing, but it's for poor people with ambitions to integrate into the educational system. Uh, Oakland uh, has linked its affordable housing to transit centers. A famous community there called Fruitvale uh, links uh, uh, equity and, and, and housing uh, to where people live. New York City, Mayor Bloomberg had a 100,000 unit affordable housing goal. Mayor de Blasio, his successor, has a 200,000 affordable housing goal. And amazingly, it's being achieved. They're making massive progress because they have intentionally forced themselves on that track. Cities are showing equity in how we learn. Uh, Denver has a city-led scholarship program where the city passed a bond issue to create an endowment so that they can legitimately say, if you graduate from a Denver public school, you will have the money to go to college. We have that program in San Antonio as well. It doesn't exist in all of our high schools. We're up to, I think, 36 now of our high schools. But if you graduate from one of those high schools with a B average and 90% attendance, we have the money in the San Antonio Education Partnership to put you uh, into school. Some into a community college, if that's what they can get into, others into a four-year school. In addition, San Antonio, I'm very proud to say under Julian Castro, passed a bond issue, it wasn't a bond issue, it was a one-eighth cent sales tax. We took one-eighth of the sales tax that had been set aside for mobility, for transportation, and the people of San Antonio voted to allocate that tax for the nation's first municipally run pre-K program. We have four campuses that if you drive by them, look like a com community college. Only all the students are four years old. <laughs> it's an amazing thing to see. That has now existed for five years and is up for, uh, for, for, for reallocating the tax. We have to have another election in November of 2020 and the polling shows 70% support for continuing that tax for pre-K education. So in all of these categories, uh, we see evidence of cities finding ways to put equity into their responsibilities in one form or another. Now, as I said, there are many pieces here, but, uh, but no city that I'm aware of yet has said, this is a goal which we're going to use to organize city efforts and pull it all together. But imagine if a city pulled the pieces together and said, this is our purpose. This is why we exist as a community. This is the next evolution of city governance in our society. We would go from a city's thinking about economics and the purpose of economic development in the hope that it produces greater GDP to a city that focuses on its jobs mix, its wage mix, its investments to build a middle class from among its marginalized residents. From one set of metrics to another definition and set of metrics of what defines a successful city. A city would go from, uh, for example, investing in its infrastructure to support traditional growth to, on the other hand, a city investing in infrastructure as the driver of economic opportunities, its transit system, its sustainable energy, its anchor institutions, its broadband, all of them with an equity dimension. That's the way one would think differently if one had that kind of an overarching template. 
These are not either our choices. You don't have to take from one to give to another. They're not fixed shares of prosperity. We grow the pie to include more people and create a sense of dynamic inclusion. That's, in my view, what, 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 what cities need to gravitate to. The third thing I said I'd talk about is Houston. So let's talk a little bit about Houston. And I want to use as the base for this Professor Kleinberg's 38th survey. He's been doing this since 1982. And here's what Houston believes about its own equity situation. This is Houstonians talking about Houston. Low-skilled, well-paid, blue-collar jobs are disappearing in the wake of globalization. Some form of post-secondary education is now required for almost all well-paying jobs. Yet, in Houston, only 22% of students who begin the eighth grade have completed any college-level program by 2017. 12 years later, 22% of the students who begin the eighth grade have completed any college level program 12 years later. Survey respondents last year also affirmed by 67 to 33% the necessity for education beyond high school in order to qualify for a well-paid job. Blacks and Hispanics appear to be more aware than any other portion of the population of that connection. So people understand we have to have accession to college, higher education, technical education on a greater scale in Houston. 56 to 42 percent of Houstonians believe that the schools will need more money to accomplish those objectives and if we expect to provide a quality education. Here's an important point. Four out of 10 in the survey participants in Houston in 2019 said they, they could not put together $400 in savings if they had to, to draw on for emergency. Four out of 10. One fourth of all area residents do not have health insurance. And one third said they had difficulty during the past year paying for groceries to feed their families or covering the cost of housing. One fourth have no health insurance, and one-third at some point in the last year felt stress in meeting basic family costs and budget needs in, uh, for, for, for housing and for food. Uh, so these are just a couple of the things that, that, um, uh, that, that Houstonians know about Houston. Uh, Professor, have I stated your survey correctly here? Is there any other specific point that you would want to make that is even more persuasive than what I've tried to state here from your survey? Well, I think one of the key findings is a growing understanding on the part of the general public of the importance of education, the willingness to spend more money on education, on the critical importance of preschool, a shift in understanding that is, that bodes well if we can find a way to translate that into effective action. I didn't set that up, but it's a perfect segue for the next point that I need to make. <laughs> I want to talk to you briefly, and I'll wind down here in a few minutes. With, he said, more and more Houstonians recognize the importance of education as a primary instrument for creating economic opportunity, economic equity in Houston. More and more people, the surveys show, make that connection. Is that correct? Um, let me just describe what might be the elements of a overarching Houston equity strategy. Again, to harness the power, the momentum of one of the greatest cities in the world, one of the most prosperous cities in the world, one of the best endowed cities in the world in basic assets like the airports and the Port Authority and the great universities uh, and the medical center and, and, and push them in the direction of creating the dynamics. Again, I said earlier, these are not either our choices. This is not take from somebody to give to another. This is to create growth in a way that makes it possible for, for people to get a better shot, to have more fluidity in their economic mobility. What are some things that could be done? Well, we'll start with education. Obviously, commitment to uh, uh, public education to accessibility to the community colleges, 
accessibility to the, the great educational institutions that exist in Houston. Today at noon, I was with about 150 students at the University of Houston downtown branch. And what I saw was the perfect kind of transition for students who would have never had a chance in a previous era, who are now in that institution and getting a crack at education. That's the kind of investment, reaching deep into the neighborhoods, into populations that normally haven't had a chance. But I would make the case that preschool might be a place to start. Cities in America are now making a commitment to universal preschool. Now that's gonna be easier to do with the recent state legislative action in the last session that makes, pre universal, that makes preschool more available. Not universal because it is income related. But here's what Houstonians say about preschool. And again, professor, correct me if I state this wrong. The surveys show, and this is the Houston Education Research uh, Consortium state that uh, Houstonians believe that preschool opportunities are too far in distance from, from what they can access. Of, uh, the largest indicate, when, when the criterion is set as a mile, do you have preschool within a mile of you? The majority of Houston's say, Houstonians say no. There is preschool in Houston in some schools for economically disadvantaged children, but it is not necessarily English related preschool at a time when a greater proportion of the population in Houston is English language students that need the access to preschool. So there's a mismatch between where it is and to whom it's offered at a time when we know what the demographics of Houston look like. If San Antonio can pass a one-eighth allocation of sales tax to put in place preschool, Houston can do it. Uh, so the, uh, the, 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 but the question is intentionality, priority, uh, et cetera, education. Second strategy that I think would influence um, uh, equity issues is the support for emerging and small businesses. Houston has done a great job over the years just in the way small businesses grow here, a heavy participation by immigrants and immigrant families in small businesses. But now, with the Midtown Innovation District and the use of the Sears Building in that way, there is concrete efforts to put together incubators, tech innovation centers that will allow that transformation to be made. More emphasis and more specificity in that arena is critical. I am a big, big fan of how immigrants uh, utilize small business. They're not able to access corporate jobs for a variety of reasons, but they want to work. They're a hardworking population, and they're pride, pride they're, they're proud people. And they will set up businesses, whether it's landscaping or asphalt or roofing or framing or masonry, they will set up businesses. And it's a wonderful thing to see. I was at a church recently, and the priest recognized me, so he asked me to stand at the back at the end of the mass and just say hello to people. And I was impressed with a number of people who came through, men in blue jeans with shoes covered with concrete from the week, rough hands, and introduced me to their son or daughter who was with them in their business. And when I went in out of the parking lot, there was the parking, there was the pickup truck with the wheelbarrow in the back and the name Hernandez and Sons on the, on the door. It's a phenomenal thing that's happening in, in Houston in that respect, and it needs to be harnessed because that's generational wealth being created. That's uh, uh, success at one level that can be translated into success in the next generation. Small and emerging business strategies. Related to that is training of the workforce. The Greater Houston Partnership has set up what's called Upskill Houston. It's very important. It's concentrated on Houston's unique assets like 230,000 manufacturing jobs in Houston that need to be refilled. And opportunities like uh, the construction sector. There's a well-organized effort in construction, but a continuing effort in job training, broader, uh, uh, assisted, uh, is important. In San Antonio, we've had an effort called Project Quest for 
27 years now, that, has, that goes into the neighborhoods, identifies people who ought to be in training programs, brings them through orientation and, 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 and builds them through the community college system into the training that they need. Our cities need to be doing that sort of thing with an equity focus. The next issue that I would mention is affordable housing. Our cities in the Southwest, in the Texas Triangle, we were talking about this today, have had a better uh, record on affordable housing uh, because we have lots of land to build on, we have fewer uh, regulations that, that, that are barriers to entry for builders, uh, and uh, because our, our, our land use uh, laws are such that people can build, but it is getting harder and it is getting uh, more difficult to build in close proximity to where the populations are. People have to drive longer distances to get an affordable home and such. Again, cities are focusing, as I mentioned, New York and a goal of 200,000 on understanding the absolute significance of affordable housing. I didn't understand it as mayor, but I learned it as HUD secretary, that housing is the basic precondition from which you can do things like train people for work, expect til children to get a good education, uh, help people who are suffering in health. Because if you, if you don't have a safe, decent, healthy place to live in, all of these other things cannot be done. So it's right at the heart of our social strategies for our communities. The fourth thing I would mention is mobility. Congratulations on the measure that is on the ballot uh, on November 4th, uh, 5th, November 5th, uh, which is the mobility measure that will unleash $7.5 billion worth of capital to further enhance Houston's mobility system. Again, this is an area I never really fully appreciated. The connection between mobility and equity. It's the way people get to work. It's the way they get to health care. It has to be within reach of neighborhoods that need it. In San Antonio, the poorest neighborhoods are 12 times rely, as reliant on public, on public transit as the, the, the more upwardly scale neighborhoods. That makes sense because of access to vehicles and such, but it just drives home how significant public transit is to, getting, to creating a kind of a, a sense of equity. It is an equity instrument, and the commitments that Houston has made are immense and impressive. You have a very good system, and properly endowed, it can be a major factor in bringing uh, people and, and the community together. Finally, among these things, I would say, is a strategy that I have kind of intuitively felt for a long time, and I hope to sort of proselytize for it in San Antonio, and that is this. I was, when I was mayor, I noticed that we were making a lot of allocations from our community development block grant monies for disparate purposes, funding this organization and this organization and that program and this wellness program and this literacy program and this nutrition program, but they were basically to organizations who were the best at lobbying and the organizations who had long histories, but they really didn't connect into anything. They were just sort of throwing colored dye into the water and watching it dissipate, right? Now, we also have a very rich level of nonprofit and philanthropic activity. So we have people who give large sums of money to the symphony and large sums of money to the Girl Scouts and large sums of money to the United Way, immensely organized programs, but they too are falling all over the community and we don't know what they amount to. Cities are now talking about identifying how they can have, quote, collective impact. That is to say, let us define a critical area of poverty or unemployment or educational need and then recruit all of these resources and all of this energy to really solve that problem. Now, let me just say a quick word. I'm, I know I'm going long, so let me just say, in the San Antonio case, the issue is poverty, has been for a long time. We're a poor city. But what, what is poverty? What kind of poverty? Is it poverty caused by the history of low wages? Or is it poverty caused by a history of low education and inappropriate skills? 
Is it poverty caused by immigrants coming into the community and working for super low wages? What, is the, what kind of poverty are we trying to address? We have to understand more about the dynamics of it, but when we do, we should put all our efforts together and focus on that in a more coordinated way. I was pleased to see one of the city councilmen in San Antonio wrote an op-ed the other day in which he said, the city ought to turn its CDBG, its Community Development Block Grant Funds, which is the federal funds that come in for multiple uh, allocation, to United Way, because United Way has a strategy, and they're, and they're making decisions on an organized basis. It's rare for any public official to say, give up authority to allocate funds, but his argument was, we need coherence, we need an umbrella, and that would be a start. It's a small start, but it is a start. And in a city like Houston, there's a lot of money and a lot of power that can be put behind specific goals. Well, let me close my remarks to you tonight, once again, thanking uh, Rice and the Kinder Center for uh, creating this series where people could come and listen to thoughts about urban ideas from across the country. Um, I, uh, uh, w I was assigned the subject of talking about equity in cities and equity in our, our national future because I wrote a little uh, book for the Urban Land Institute Actually, two. The first one was an eye-opener for me because it focused on the first point I made tonight, which is the cities are doing pretty well. We're past the urban crisis now. We're into a place where we're creating these engines that are the engines of the American economy. The second book was on, now that we know that, how do we think in terms of using that platform for, some, for good, for, for a broader good, especially when the other levels of government seem to have lost their direction or capacities on these questions of equity. So I'm very, very pleased to share these thoughts with you this evening, and they fall in the context of a larger, larger history, and that is the history of cities since ancient times. And I'll close my remarks to you tonight by recalling the oath that was asked of the citizens of Athens that speaks to me of common cause, a vision of living together in a community in these magnificent places we call cities. If you look at them in historic terms, they've been very important to humankind. In fact, there's an author in England who said they're the most important invention of the human race. Interesting idea, how we live together, how we work together, pretty, 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 pretty basic and pretty profound. This is what was asked of the citizens of Athens, the oath. We will fight for the ideals and sacred things of the city, both alone and with many. We will revere and obey the city's laws and will do our best to incite a like reverence and respect in those above us who are prone to annul them or set them at naught. We will strive unceasingly to quicken the public sense of civic duty. Thus, in these ways, we will transmit this city not only not less, but greater and more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. That's what cities can be. That's what cities are about. And that's what Houston is about. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you.